Good afternoon and welcome to Van Dievener Black's presentation, Cultivating a Cannabis Business under Virginia's new marijuana law. My name is Jonathan Gallo and I'll be presenting today with attorney Ann Bebo and Jeffrey Hempel of Van Dievener Black. And today we're going to go over some of the uh, basic highlights of uh, Virginia's new cannabis law. Uh, but before we begin, I want to talk a little bit about some housekeeping issues. If you have any questions, please submit those questions in the question block up at the top of the screen. That's the bubbles with the question mark. We're going to try to reserve some time at the end of the presentation to answer those questions. Uh, additionally, uh, just uh, in case you're interested, this presentation is being recorded and it will be uh, sent out along with a thank you to all of the attendees. So if you missed anything, don't worry. It will be recorded and you can reference it later. Next slide, please. So first, a disclaimer. This presentation is for general advice. It is not legal or tax advice, nor does it create an attorney-client relationship. Next slide, please. And then another disclaimer. Even though there's been a flurry of activity in Congress uh, and over the past several years with the issuance of the Cole Memo and then rescission of the Cole Memo by the Department of Justice and then the passage of the Blumenauer McClintlock Norton Lee Budget Amendment and the House of Representatives last year related to the enforcement of uh, federal marijuana laws, possession using, distributing and or selling marijuana or marijuana, marijuana based products is illegal under federal law regardless of any state law that may decriminalize or legalize such activity. Today's presentation is to provide you information on changes in Virginia's law. It's in no way intended to provide any advice, guidance, or assistance in violating any federal, state, or local laws. Next slide, please. So today, as I said, we're gonna discuss Virginia's recently passed marijuana law and what uh, entrepreneurs need to know about the legal framework of that law. We're gonna provide an overview of Virginia's cannabis landscape as it is today. Then we're gonna be discussing Virginia's new marijuana law. I'll then be turning it over to Attorney Hempel uh, to discuss business and employment considerations along with Attorney Bebo. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about Virginia's cannabis landscape in a little bit more detail so we can distinguish what the main focus of our discussion is going to be today. Next slide. So we're going to talk about three areas of Virginia's cannabis landscape. Pharmaceutical processors for medical cannabis, industrial hemp, and then Virginia's latest law, marijuana related cannabis. Next slide, please. Here's an overview of the pharmaceutical processor landscape in Virginia. This was instituted back in 2015 and Virginia allowed the use and possession of CBD or THCA oil to treat certain conditions in children and later on in adults. That was later expanded over the years, as you can see in 2016, 18 and 19 across the state. It then expanded the spectrum of products that will be available that are available for treatment, including cap capsules, topicals, lozenges, lollipops and other related products. And then in 2020, Virginia allowed parents, patients and legal guardians to legally possess cannabis oil. Next slide. Virginia's medical cannabis industry is located in four health service areas. There are in fact five health service areas. However, health service area one is vacant. That particular license was rescinded and it is now in litigation. So presently, there are only four health service areas in operation, number two through five in Virginia, and they are being operated by those companies. They are presently in operation and are dispensing medical cannabis products. Interestingly, as I indicated, a uh, flurry of uh, legislation in the federal government, there's also been additional legislation and it didn't get a lot of attention in Virginia. Um, Governor North, the, 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 both the legislature in Virginia passed and Governor Northam signed House Bill 2281 and Senate Bill 1333, which as of July 1st will permit pharmaceutical processors 
to distribute and sell other products other than cannabis oil, and then includes botanical cannabis, usable cannabis, and cannabis products. So they're going to be able to offer more cannabis products at those pharmaceutical processors. But again, it's only to those who have a registration uh, and are authorized to do so under those statutes. It's not open for the general population. It's only open for those who have proper registration under the Board of Pharmacy and a recommendation from their physician. Next slide, please. Next, we have Virginia's industrial hemp business. Industrial hemp was made legal by the 2018 Farm Bill. Previously, hemp had been illegal um, under the same Controlled Substances Act that makes marijuana illegal. The 2018 Agriculture Act removed hemp as defined under the Controlled Substances Act. Now it's defined specifically as containing no more than 0.3% THC by weight. So that's a specific definition for hemp, but that is legal. And it's regulated by a number of federal bodies as well as the Commonwealth of Virginia, the regulating body in the Commonwealth of Virginia to industrial hemp is the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. They are the primary regulator through December of 2021, and they will continue to operate the program this year as they did in previous years, consistently with the previous Farm Bill. Next slide. I just saw a question come up. Does the bill that I previously mentioned signed by Governor Northam mean medical dispensaries can start selling recreationally on July 1st? No, it does not. It only allows the sale of those particular cannabis products to those who are already authorized to obtain cannabis products at the uh, pharmaceutical processors. It does not allow the sale of recreational cannabis from those pharmaceutical processors. Um, the current state of Virginia's law um, up until July 1st, 2021 with regard to simple possession of cannabis is that it was decriminalized back on July 1st of 2020 and it is a civil offense. There's a rebuttable presumption that a person who possesses no more than one ounce uses it for personal use. That is the law as it stands now until the new law becomes effective. Next slide, please. Next slide. So Virginia's new marijuana law, let's discuss it. Let's discuss it. So Senate Bill 1406 and House Bill 2312. This law was signed by Governor Northam last month. It has a staggered implementation, and I'm going to be talking about that in a little more detail as we go along. That's important to understand. There's a number of provisions in this particular law that are effective July 1st of this year, while other provisions have a staggered implementation or ramp up. And some of those provisions need to be reenacted in the next legislative body in order for them to become effective. <clears throat> we don't have time to cover all of the provisions of the law in the hour we have, so we're going to focus on some key provisions. So as of July 1st, 2021, those 21 years or older can legally possess up to one ounce of marijuana without the intent to distribute. It also allows home cultivation by those 21 years of older of up to four marijuana plants per household with certain conditions. And it's important to note that that is per household, not per person. Still, as of July 1st, 2021, the sale of marijuana in the Commonwealth remains illegal. <clears throat> it is only this limited possession. It does not allow sales of marijuana in the Commonwealth as of July 1st, 2021. That is still considered illegal. Next slide, please. In addition, the law creates a very large regulatory framework with the primary regulator being the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority. We're gonna discuss the VCCA in more detail in the upcoming slides. It also creates a number of programs directed at supporting cannabis businesses. I'm not gonna go through all of them here, but they include the Cannabis Equity Reinvestment Board and its accompanying fund. And the purpose of that fund is to directly address the impact of economic disinvestment, violence, and historic overuse of criminal justice responses to communities and individual needs. And its goal is to provide support to persons and families and communities that are historically and disproportionately targeted and affected by drug enforcement. 
It's also intended to offer scholarship opportunities and educational and vocational resources who have been adversely impacted by substance use and awarding grants to support workforce development, mentoring programs, and job training and placement services. It also creates the Cannabis Equity Loan Program and accompanying fund, which I'm gonna discuss in more detail in upcoming slides. It allows for the expungement and in certain cases, resentencing for marijuana related offenses. It states that consumer and retail sales may begin on January 1st, 2024. These provisions have to be reenacted by the legislature next session. It also permits a local referendum on the prohibition of retail marijuana stores. That also has to be reenacted in 2022. It also imposes new taxes and modifies and creates criminal penalties. And Jeffrey Hempel is gonna discuss the taxes issue in the upcoming slides. It also funds a public awareness campaign on health and safety risks and training for law enforcement. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the governing authority, the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority. The newly created VCCA has broad authority to administer the state legalized cannabis business in Virginia, and it is implemented January 1st, 2021. It's tasked with establishing the regulatory scheme for all aspects of the cannabis program in the Commonwealth. It needs to promulgate regulations by July 1st, 2023. It cannot adopt them, however, until July 1st, 2022, because they have to be approved by the Cannabis Oversight Commission. But the regulations are going to cover everything with regard to the cannabis business in Virginia. I've listed a number of them here. It'll establish the regulatory scheme for manufacturer testing and wholesale wholesaling licensing structures, and that includes denials, revocations, and a hearing process for those who are denied a license. It's also going to establish the criteria and preferences for uh, evaluation of social equity license applicants, and I'm gonna discuss that in a little bit more detail. Vertical integration, that means um, allowing persons, and when I say persons here in the law, persons is defined as not only uh, natural persons, but also businesses. So whenever I say persons, it's interchangeable. It limits vertical integrations to small businesses. The goal is to ensure all licensees have a meaningful opportunity to per participate in the market. So it does allow or is supposed to allow certain persons to be granted or have an interest in a license in more than one of the categories. And I'll talk about those categories coming up, but it's going to be very limited. What constitutes a small business under the law? It's not specifically defined. We'll have to wait and see what the regulations say once they're promulgated by the VCCA. The VCCA is also going to provide for prohibitions and restrictions on licenses in a locality or region, and they're also going to be able to establish the number of licenses the person may be granted to operate an establishment in a single locality. It's also going to put limits on allowable square footage of marijuana stores. Presently, they're set at 1,500 square feet. It's going to establish standards for preferences for qualified social equity applicants. And interestingly, um, the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority can start accepting applications beginning July 1st, 2023, but they must give preference to qualified social equity applicants between July 1st, 2023 and January 1st, 2024. It also requires the VCCA to evaluate geographic dispersion of retail stores. Um, under their regulations, they're required to evaluate the dispersion of those stores after the issuance of 100, 200, and 300 licenses. Again, much of this must be reenacted in 2022. The VCCA does have to start writing their regulations once they become active in, on July 1st, 2021. But a number of these provisions that I've previously mentioned must be reenacted in 2022 in order for them to become effective. Next slide, please. So I talked about 
social equity license applicants. The way the law is written, this is the definition of, of what constitutes a social equity license applicant. They have to have lived or been domiciled in Virginia for at least 12 months, and they have to be one of these five categories. And I'm not going to read through this to all of you. As far as the first one is concerned, um, with 66% ownership of persons who have been convicted or adjudicated delinquent for misdemeanor violations of certain offenses, those would be the offenses 248.1, sale, gift, or distribution of marijuana, 250.1, possession of marijuana, and 265.3, sale of drug paraphernalia. You can see that this is to totally focused on residents of the Commonwealth, because if you notice with um, social equity license applicant number five, at least 66 percent ownership by a person who graduated from a historically black college located in the Commonwealth, not a college outside of the Commonwealth, but located in the Commonwealth. So these are the categories of social equity licensed applicants who, according to the law as it's written now, will get preference. The amount of preference will be determined by the regulations written by the VCC, VCCA, but they should they are supposed to get preference with the initial uh, group of license applications. Next slide. The law also creates, <clears throat> excuse me, the Virginia Cannabis Equity Business Loan Program, along with the, the VCCA is to administer this program with community development financial institutions. The pur purpose of this program is to provide opportunity for qualified social equity applicants to start up a cannabis business. It's going to provide technical assistance, low to zero interest loans to qualified applicants, and support to allow qualified social equity applicants to apply and successfully run a cannabis vis uh, business in the Commonwealth. Next slide. Now, with regard to the license, these are the license types that are listed in the legislation. Now, the VCCA has the responsibility for developing its regulations to limit the number of licenses as they see fit. However, the legislature has determined at this time that these are the maximum number of licenses that can be issued under these different classes. Cultivation facilities are 450. There's a class A and a class B license. They're separated out. Class A's are based on number of plants and or size of the grow area, whereas class B are, are uh, restricted by the uh, potency of the crop. Manufacturing facility at 60, wholesaler at 25, retail stores at 400. You'll notice that there's not a limit uh, for tent number of testing licenses. However, there is a restriction. A person that has an interest in a marijuana testing facility license cannot have an interest in a licensed marijuana cultivation facility, manufacturing facility, wholesaler, or retail marijuana store. It is up to the VCCA to determine the application or license fees and any waiver of those fees. Those are not listed in statute. They'll have to come with the regulations. Additionally, it's important to know that this uh, limitation on licenses does not include those issued to pharmaceutical processors of medical cannabis or industrial hemp processors that are registered. They too can get licenses, although they're not permitted to get a license in more than one uh, category unless they pay uh, a $1 million fee to the fund, but they are allowed to get these licenses as well. So this cap does not include any licenses issued to those businesses that are already operating under current state law. Next slide, please. Okay, and with that, I will turn over the presentation to Mr. Hemphill to discuss some business considerations. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'm gonna talk about First, we're going to talk about structuring the business, and I'm going to preface this by saying that uh, a regular portion of my business every year as a lawyer is undoing messes caused by people going into business together without thinking through all the issues. Um, I really don't have a problem with LegalZoom because I get, a, um, I get uh, significant fees each year undoing them. Um, 
the there are four basic types of entity that you can operate your business out of the first two uh, on the, on the screen the sole proprietorship and the partnership i'm just not even going to talk about uh, because you just shouldn't do it because your personal assets are at risk for every business liability um, so we're going to focus on the next two a corporation um, which is uh, a separate entity and you you'll you, you've You've heard of them before. Uh, it is uh, a, a business entity that has uh, shareholders and it's run by officers and a board of directors. And then you have a limited liability company, which is similar. It's kind of a hybrid between a corporation and a partnership. Now, this is going to be very, very basic for some of you, uh, but others uh, have not gone through these specific issues. So, um, I'm going to try not to be too basic, but uh, there are some some things that we need to to talk about. And, and one one of the biggest problems that I see out there is that there's this thing called the internet, uh, and not everything that you read on it is true. Uh, I get a lot of people coming to me to say, "Well, I'm supposed to set up my LLC in uh, Wyoming, therefore I'm never going to get any tax." It's just it just doesn't work that way. So be really, really careful uh, about implementing anything that you read on the internet uh, with things like selection of entity and uh, business taxation. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Next slide, please. So one of the things that uh, we'll talk about is, you know, what is this entity? Who owns it? That's important. Who controls it? You know, who's signing contracts and making decisions? And uh, what what are the liabilities ancillary to these to these uh, organizations? Next slide, please. And again, I'm not going to talk about the sole proprietorship because anyone who decide who wants to go in as a sole proprietor, you're making a big mistake. And I just simply no no practicing attorney uh, worth his license is going to uh, recommend that. Next slide, please. Same thing with partnerships. It's an outdated concept. Next slide, please. And keep going. I just leave this information in there so you can compare and contrast on your own time. All right, corporation, uh, it is a formal business entity. You uh, have a, a filing with the, the State Corporation Commission that is going to give you your certificate. Uh, and at that time, you are a legal entity. Um, the shareholders own it. So if you're going into business with a few uh, friends, uh, acquaintances, family members, um, you are going to be purchasing shares or contributing capital to the corporation to receive shares, uh, and that is going to be the evidence of your ownership. Next slide, please. Who controls it? There's a kind of a the three level um, ownership and, and control. The, the stockholders own it, and what they do is they appoint a board of directors, and the board of directors kind of oversees the general uh, business venture, and they appoint officers who control the day-to-day -day op, uh, operations. Now, you can be all three. You can be a shareholder, you can be a director and an officer. That's okay. Or you can be one of the three or two of the three. That's 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 perfectly okay. What liabilities are involved? The best thing, and this is almost number one in any presentation about business entity selection is, uh, you are going into this and you are going to risk the money that you put into the business, but you don't want to risk your house, uh, your kids college fund, your retirement. You don't want to risk any of that. So you want to keep your personal assets separate. So uh, the great benefit of a corporation is uh, yes, if you get sued, your business assets are at risk, but your personal assets are not. Um, corporations come in two basic flavors. The standard uh, default corporation is what's called a C corporation, uh, which is for, for the subtitle in the uh, subchapter in the Internal Revenue Code for how it's taxed. So a C corporation is taxed at the corporate level. So the corporation brings in $100. They're going to be paying tax at the corporate rate of currently 21%. It'll go up to 28 with the new tax bill. And then if you distribute money out to these st stockholders by a dividend or a distribution, uh, it's going to be taxed again to the shareholder at their rate. Uh, and so you have tax you're on the same dollar that came in. You're 
being taxed on it twice. So that's not really attractive to people. So for smaller businesses, they have um, in, they instituted the S corporation, which is basically a flow through. So if that dollar comes in, it does not get taxed at the corporate level, uh, but it flows through and gets taxed to the owners, the, the stockholders. Next slide, please. The LLC. Uh, again, it is a formal uh, entity that you file uh, articles of organization with the State Corporation Commission, and then you have a business. It is owned not, not by stockholders, but now by members. Next slide, please. There's two basic ways to structure the, the control uh, or the management of an LLC. One is just by the members. Uh, so if you have three members, you all get together and you, you vote on, on how to do things and divvy up the tasks and you just operate that way. The other way is to, to appoint managers. Uh, and a manager can be a member or, or does not have to be a member. So maybe the, there's three members who are owners of the LLC and they just want to appoint someone who's really good at uh, operating a uh, whatever, a, a marijuana dispensary, uh, and they appoint that person as the manager of the company. Next slide, please. Uh, very similar to the corporations. This is why I didn't even talk about sole proprietors and, and partnerships because we already have two vehicles uh, that are very good at protecting your personal assets. So the LLC provides the same, um, the, the same liability protection as the corporation. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, Back in law school, you you have this this phrase that runs through your head throughout your entire business association class. It's called piercing the corporate veil. It's lawyer speak for uh, how does someone get to your personal assets even if you have an LLC or a corporation. Um, the good thing is Virginia is a very good state in which to to do business. They respect the corporate form and they don't they don't like to pierce the corporate veil or disregard that LLC or that corporation. But if you uh, if you do not recognize the formalities uh, which are going to be keeping up your corporate charter or your LLC charter, um, keeping a corporate record book and a record of the members, uh, minutes of meetings uh, and having a separate bank account. Um, that's if you know you have to do these very simple things. If you do not do that, if you just run it out of your own personal bank account and call yourself a corporation, it's not going to work. They're they're going to be able to get to your personal assets. So it's really important to know how to structure it, know what the formalities are, and to separate funds. Uh, you don't you don't go and uh, and buy groceries out of your business account. You, if you need money to pay for groceries, then you write yourself either a salary check or a bonus check or a distribution check. Uh, and then you and you put that into your personal account and then you can buy your groceries. But you just, you do not mix business and pleasure or business and personal uh, activities. Uh, there are also some other ways. Uh, if you're going to fraudulently use this corporation, pretending you're a corporation, even though you weren't, they're going to be able to get to your personal assets. Um, and you will have personal personal liability if as a uh, manager or an officer, if you breach a fiduciary duty to that corporation, uh, in other words, like stealing from the company or um, uh, using trade secrets to to go and s set up a, a competitor, things like that, then they can get to you. Next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, OK, so just some basic things you have to do when you form your business. You have to get an EIN. That's your IRS tax number. Uh, you're going to have to go down to um, City Hall and get a business license in any location in which you are operating in uh, state of Virginia. The State Corporation Commission is where you file your um, original articles of incorporation or organization and you will have annual filings uh, with them. Um, insurance. If you have employees, you're going to be getting workers' compensation. Uh, you're going to want a general liability. Um, if you are leasing space, you may want to put some um, uh, renters insurance or, or some type of commercial renters insurance. Uh, and you know, just you, you want to insure your assets as best you can. Uh, and then you're going to want to assemble a team. Again, um, I, I undo 
people's uh, self-made uh, documents all the time or when they come and practically draw things on a napkin or or just a, a word file that they just made up um, you're going to want to talk with an attorney um, about setting up because there's a, there's just an, a lot of issues so you get into business with your your two uh, friends and you maybe you know each other for a long time and you're great friends and you're just going to make millions of dollars and you you would never have a problem with any of your friends and the problem is that money happens uh, and whenever there's money involved and when there's difficult decisions people can disagree and you're going to need a, a method for uh, solving those disagreements you, and you want to just resolve issues like well what happens if someone dies what happens to their shares what happens if they're disabled they're not they're not dead yet so that, but they they can't operate what happens if they simply just don't like the business and want to go you know, move to california and get into real estate or whatever it is uh, you want to address these exit strategies ahead of time and you do that in the corporation with a stockholder agreement or an llc with an operating agreement these are somewhat long and involved documents um, but what they do is they get all the issues out on the table ahead of time before you get into business when it might be too late to deal with some of these issues so it's important i think to speak with an attorney uh, about how to set up your business ahead of time the accountant uh, especially if you have employees you're running payroll you want someone who knows what they're doing who can file your business entity returns and help you with um, all of the accounting issues that uh, arise when you're running a business your bookkeeper is going to be the person recording all of your uh, uh, income and expenses on a daily basis. That's really important. They're going to be working with the accountant to make sure you've got all your records kept. And this is going to be a regulated in uh, industry. You're going to need to keep good records. Um, insurance broker you may want for um, the various coverages we talked about. Um, you may have IT issues. You might, you know, who knows? Maybe you get into you're, you're growing so well that you implement a 401k plan. So you're going to want a benefits advisors, but uh, you're going to want a banker um, so you just got you, you don't do this alone there's there's professionals out there who who love helping businesses um, and we're we're here to help with with all these issues next slide please before we get to banking and that's Anne's one I did want to talk about the taxes uh, in in just in general there is a along with the new act there's a brand new marijuana tax um, and you know when, whenever you sell something in Virginia it's going to be subject to sales tax in Hampton Roads where I am right now it's it's six percent and five percent in many other areas of the state six percent in some others depending on um, the very recent legislation but so you sell you sell a widget and and there's going to be a six percent sales tax well uh, in order to raise more money, they levied a 21% marijuana tax at the state level, which is in addition to the state uh, retail sales and use tax. Uh, so you're already up at 27% tax, and then they are going to allow the localities to uh, levy an additional 3% on top of that. Uh, this is going to be a monthly tax. Uh, that you are going to be filing uh, a, a monthly return. Anyone who's been in the restaurant business or in, in a other retail business knows that you're basically filing monthly returns with all your numbers on it, uh, and you're going to be uh, remitting that tax. They um, have a provision in this act where if they don't feel comfortable, uh, they have a lot of wiggle room to make you bond the taxes. So that's going to be something that is a potential personal liability if you make sales and do not collect the tax and remit it to the government on a monthly basis. Um, and so with that, uh, that concludes this portion of the uh, presentation and I'm going to turn it over to Anne, who's going to talk about the banking issues. Thanks, Jeff. So Jeff just um, threw some cold water on your dreams of making a fortune in the marijuana industry, and I'm going to add a little more cold water to it. In addition to all the tax issues that he just talked about and how the government's going to take a massive bite out of your profits, uh, one thing you need to be aware of getting into the marijuana industry is that, as Jonathan said at the beginning of the presentation, it's still illegal under federal law. So as a result, a lot of the systems that are set up to help other businesses are not available to marijuana businesses. Um, Jeff mentioned that you know at the beginning of a business relationship, you want to have clear exit strategies. And unfortunately, um, in any industry, a lot of new businesses fail. Most businesses, when they 
fail, they have um, access to the bankruptcy courts to um, purge them of their debts or help them restructure so they can turn the business around and continue to be or become profitable again. Bankruptcy law is foreclosed, is not available to marijuana businesses because marijuana is illegal under federal law. So there have been a lot of cases of businesses that are involved in the marijuana industry, including businesses that are indirectly involved in the marijuana industry, such as a real estate company that um, leases space to a marijuana business. Those businesses being denied bankruptcy protection because it's a violation of the federal law. So the fact that your business derives some income, even if it's only a portion of the income from marijuana, you're not eligible to um, seek recourse through the bankruptcy protection. So that's one handicap that businesses in this industry have. Another is banking. Um, it's gotten a little better um, at the very beginning when businesses in other states first started to allow marijuana, you would hear horror stories about these businesses not having access to banks, having to deal strictly in cash and doing things like maintaining warehouses where they stored their cash because they couldn't use banks and actually having a problem with um, the cash disintegrating, rotting before it could be used. Um, it is a little better now, um, but there still are limits on access that marijuana related businesses have to banks. Um, there is uh, um, a, there are several laws that apply to banks that um, are in place to um, prevent banks from being used for money laundering or for other criminal activity. And they require banks to report um, any suspicious activity to the feds. They have to let the, um, the federal authorities know if they see any sign of criminal activity in the banking that they're um, managing. There are, um, there's the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. There's guidance regarding that. Well, um, Jonathan mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, the Cole memos. And those were memos from the Justice Department um, several years ago that were meant to reassure businesses and banks that even though marijuana is illegal under federal law, the Justice Department isn't going to come after you. They're not going to enforce or prosecute um, someone for violating those marijuana laws if the business, such as banking, is being run consistently with state cannabis laws. Basically, as long as you're compliant with your state laws, we the feds aren't going to come after you, so you don't have to be as worried banks that you're going to um, be in trouble so long as you're complying with state law. Well, in 2014, Attorney General Jeff Sessions under the Trump administration rescinded the Cole memos, uh, but they've still basically been followed. And what the Cole memos do is they also set up a list of priorities that the federal government will prosecute certain crimes um, regarding marijuana. So for example, they want to keep marijuana out of the hands of children. If there's an indication that you're um, selling to children, the feds will come after you. Um, they want to keep marijuana revenue away from criminal organizations. So if there's an indication that your business is linked up with the mob, they'll come after you. Things like that. But the otherwise, under the Cole memos, the Justice Department and the federal government is kind of taking this hands-off approach so long as you're complying with state law. And that applies to banking, too. So um, the Treasury Department, um, I, I mentioned FinCEN, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. They have guidance that they've um, issued to banks saying it's basically showing how banks can service marijuana related businesses without running afoul of federal law and being subject to prosecution. Nonetheless, a lot of banks are hesitant to work with marijuana businesses because of this uncertainty, because it is technically still illegal under federal law. So a lot of banks are very hesitant, and this makes it really hard for marijuana businesses to access the banking services that all businesses need in order to operate. Um, there is efforts or there are efforts in Congress to try to address this problem. There's the Secure and Fair Enforcement Banking Act, SAFE. It um, has floated around Congress for a while. In April of this year, it passed the House yet again. And now we're waiting to see how the Senate, um, what the Senate does with it. I am cautiously optimistic. It seems to have a lot of bipartisan support. This is not a partisan issue at all. Um, people on both sides of the aisle recognize that more than I think half the states now have legalized marijuana in some form and these businesses need to have access to banks just like any other business. So um, both Republicans and Democrats recognize this is something that needs to be fixed. 
So the SAFE Act, if it passes, would prohibit federal banking regulators from penalizing depository institutions for providing banking services to legitimate cannabis-related businesses. So as I said, we're waiting to see what Congress does with that, what the Senate does with that. Um, fingers crossed, it would solve a lot of problems. But the bottom line to walk away with for, with regard to banking is um, banks can service marijuana-related businesses, but the regulations are very um, unclear, and a lot of banks are nervous about it and are reluctant to do it for that reason. Next slide, please. So another issue, another hurdle you might run into is that the SBA um, does not allow loans. The SBA does not provide loans to businesses that derive revenue from marijuana-related businesses. That includes both direct marijuana business and indirect marijuana business. So direct marijuana businesses are those that grow, produce, process, distribute, or sell marijuana products regardless of the amount, um, applies to personal and medical use, even if the business is legal under state law. Those are direct marijuana businesses, and they're not eligible for SBA loans. But indirect marijuana businesses are also not eligible for SBA loans. And an indirect marijuana business is one that derives any gross revenue for, from the previous year from sales to a direct marijuana business of products or services that could reasonably be determined to support the use, growth, enhancement, or other development of marijuana. So basically vendors that service direct marijuana businesses um, are in danger of being class classified as an indirect marijuana business and therefore being denied SBA loans. Next slide, please. And that, of course, means that um, the PPP loans that were made available last year as part of the pandemic, marijuana businesses were not eligible for PPP loans. And um, there have been another, a number of instances where the federal government has offered assistance like that. And if you're a marijuana business or either a direct or indirect marijuana-related business, you're not eligible for that type of financial assistance, which is one of the reasons why um, some of the provisions of the Virginia law that make um, that would provide some funding to socially disadvantaged groups may be um, a real opportunity for businesses that otherwise wouldn't have access to capital because they can't get SBA loans. Um, the SBA has uh, this guidance, this SOP document. I have the citation at the top of the slide, SOP 5010-5K. You can find it online. And it talks about, again, how businesses that derive income are not from marijuana are not eligible for SBA loans um, or other assistance. They do, however, allow hemp-related businesses to um, receive assistance from the SBA. So if you're a hemp business, as defined under um, the 2018 Farm Bill, a business that grows, produces, or processes, distributes, or sells products made from hemp, um, you would be eligible for SBA uh, assistance, but again, marijuana businesses are not. Next slide, please. Another piece of legislation that we're keeping our eye on in the federal government and Congress is the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act, the MORE Act. This law would solve a great deal of problems because it would take cannabis out of the list of scheduled substances under the Controlled Substances Act. So if this law passes, marijuana will no longer be illegal on a federal level. States could still say it's illegal in their state, but on a federal level, it would no longer be illegal. Um, this would decriminalize the manufacture, distribution, and possession of marijuana on a federal level. It would create an opportunity trust fund. It would impose taxes, going back to what Jeff talked about. It would create a community investment program. It, this law most recently passed the House in December, um, and now we're waiting to see what the Senate does with it. And again, we're seeing bipartisan support for this, less so than with the SAFE Act I spoke about a minute ago, but still, I, I think this law does have a shot and it would solve a great deal of problems. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk briefly about some employment issues and considerations that you should be aware of. Next slide, please. Um, so, if you are one of the lucky ones who gets a license from the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority, um, either for retail or processing or wholesale, any of the licenses that the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority is going to be um, issuing, if you get one of those licenses, 
it comes with certain labor requirements. Um, and this was kind of a sneak addition to the law that went in at the last minute and I found very surprising. Um, this law requires that if you get a license, the, uh, th the VCCA can suspend or revoke your license if it has reasonable cause to believe that you have failed to remain neutral regarding any union organizing efforts by employees, including car check recognition and union access to employees. That provision I found absolutely shocking for a state that has always touted itself as a right to work state, um, which means that we basically don't uh, encourage unionization here. This is a sneak attack um, of, by the unions that's going to basically allow unions in. Um, this means if you're a licensee from the VCCA and the union comes knocking, you need to throw your door wide open. You're not allowed to resist any unionizing efforts in your workplace. Uh, you can also lose your license if you fail to pay employees with prevailing wages as determined by the Department of Labor. That part's very unclear to me because prevailing wages determined by the DOL that typically applies to federal contracts, there aren't going to be, there's no prevailing wage determination from the Department of Labor for the marijuana industry. So um, it's a little unclear as to what exactly that provision means. Um, the next one's a little clearer. You can lose your license if you classify more than 10% of your workers as independent contractors and the workers aren't owners in a worker-owned cooperative. That's um, not a very surprising provision. And frankly, there's another Virginia law that creates a legal presumption that anyone that performs work for remuneration is an employee. So you really shouldn't be using independent contractors anyway. But um, as I said, you can lose your license if you do that. And then finally, you can lose your license if you've been convicted of a pattern or practice of employing unauthorized aliens in Virginia. Next slide, please. Um, another, thing, another thing you should be aware of is with regard to your customers, and um, if, if any of you are in a situation where you have employees, a lot of employers, most employers do drug testing, and a lot of people are wondering, well, how does this new um, world of marijuana legalization impact drug testing in the workplace? Testing typically reveals THC. It doesn't reveal CBD. So um, it, if someone's getting their CBD from a hemp-based source, it shouldn't contain THC, but sometimes it does. And um, some tests, basically the testing is not very accurate. Some tests only test for cannabinoids, both THC and CBD, and they don't distinguish between the two. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, testing will only show if the person consumed THC within the last several weeks. It's not very useful in telling whether or not the person is currently impaired. There's some very sophisticated drug tests you can get, but they're pretty expensive, so a lot of employers don't use them that um, can get into how much THC is in the person's system, and that can help pinpoint whether or not the person's impaired, but it's a very complex matter. It's not as easy as um, you know a blood alcohol content to tell if someone's drunk or not. Um, if the person has been using marijuana or CBD, even if the marijuana is illegal under federal law, the person might be entitled to an accommodation if they're taking it for a medical condition. They might be entitled to an accommodation not for the marijuana usage, but for their underlying medical condition. So that can um, restrict an employer's ability to do anything about the fact that the person is using marijuana. But it all, it all turns on state law. Next slide, please. So another recent change to Virginia law is in conjunction with the marijuana legalization laws that Jonathan talked about, Virginia did implement a very limited employment protection for um, people who use cannabis oil. So under this new Virginia law, employers are prohibited from discharging, discipl disciplining, discriminate, or discriminating against an employee for the employee's lawful use of cannabis oils pursuant to a valid written certification by a practitioner for a diagnosed condition or disease. So this would be people who have those written certifications that Jonathan talked about, and they're getting um, cannabis oil from one of the pharmaceutical processors for a diagnosed condition or disease. They have a limited protection in employment under Virginia law where they can't be discharged or discriminated against because of their cannabis use. However, um, they can still be disciplined or fired if they're impaired at work. 
and again, that gets into what I talked about in the last slide. How do you tell if someone's impaired at work because the drug testing is not very precise? Um, the employer can also prohibit possession of the oil during work hours. And then there's another a further exception um, that allows a little more freedom to federal contractors. Employers are not required to commit any act that would cause the employer to be in violation of federal law or that would result in loss of federal contract or funding or would require any defense industrial based sector employer to hire or retain employees who test positive for THC in excess of the limits that I have there on the slide. So that's just um, something that employers need to be aware of and something that marijuana businesses need to be aware of. There is protection under Virginia law in a limited sense for cannabis oil use if the person has a diagnosed condition or disease. Next slide, please. So that's the end of our presentation, but we have a number of questions and um, Jonathan and Jeff, I thought we could go through these together. Um, Jonathan already answered one of those. Um, the first question that we have, I'm not sure the context. The question is, how is household defined, like houses with apartments in the basement? Do you know, Jonathan, what the person was getting at there? Yeah, so when I spoke about uh, home oh, growth, basically. Yeah, so household is defined in the law as uh, individuals, whether related or not, that live in the same house or other place of residence. That's how they define it. So it's whoever's living in the same house together. Okay. Um, the next right, one question. thing I will, I'm sorry, sure. I do want to point out, which I didn't have on my slides, although home grow is allowed, um, uh, manufacturing marijuana concentrate from home cultivated marijuana is not permitted. I just wanted to make sure that that was out there, although it's not on the slide. Good point. Uh, the next question is, are caretaker programs in place or planned where a said institution at a said place cultivates the crop for medical and or recreational patients together or independently? Doing so would include policing that amount of cannabis that any patient would be allowed to possess and therefore leave the premises with. Are you aware of any such programs? No, it, it, no, I'm not aware of anything like that in the law. Um, yeah, I mean, pharmaceutical processes are allowed to get cultivation licenses the same way uh, any other person or entity is allowed to get cultivation licenses. Um, so that's that's how the law reads. Okay. The next question is, are there any special exceptions made for individuals holding hemp processing licenses? So the law allows, as I said, pharmaceutical processors and industrial hemp processors to get licenses like other entities. The law also allows, um, it, it exempts hemp processors and pharmaceutical processors from certain provisions of the law, like record keeping, certain minimal provisions, it does exempt them from. But it also allows, uh, we talked about preference for social equity applicants. It does also provide for um, slots to be left open for pharmaceutical processors uh, to get licenses. Okay. The next question is, um, someone wants to become a member of the VCCA. Does the law provide criteria for persons seeking to be members of the VCCA? Yeah, so the law does list who the members of the board of the VCCA are going to be because they control the VCCA, what their, what their basic qualifications are. But it also allows the VCCA to hire employees and whatever they're looking for, we, we don't know yet. But yes, it does list who the, uh, what the requirements are. The next question is, do we know if existing retail stores in D.C. will be allowed to obtain a Virginia license or deliver to consumers in Virginia? I'm guessing that would be um, tra interstate transport of marijuana would be prohibited, don't you think? Yeah, so the, the again, the law has a huge list uh, for the VCC on who may or may not get a license and who they may refuse to grant a license to. One of that is uh, they may refuse to grant a license to someone who's not a resident of, a com of the Commonwealth. Um, but there's also another provision of the law that uh, has to be reenacted for it to be effective. And if it is effective, it'll be effective January 1st, 2024, which says no marijuana or marijuana products can be imported, shipped, transported, or brought into the Commonwealth. So again, this law is very Virginia Commonwealth centric. So that there, there really isn't, it doesn't appear to be any provision from stores from outside of the state to be able to sell in state. Okay. 
Uh, there's a question about um, what the definition of a social equity applicant is, and we did have a slide that listed the um, what's in the statute for that. Do you want to make any other comments on that, Jonathan? Yeah, I, I have it listed, and I think we're going to post the slides what what the definition of those uh, social equity applicants are in the statute. So we're, I know we're going to post those after this, so that'll be there. Uh, the next question is, will the VCCA have any enforcement powers within its sphere? Uh, I did talk about how they can revoke your license or suspend it, so that's certainly one enforcement power they have. Are you aware of any others, Jonathan? Oh, yes. They they are permitted to uh, hire special agents who can who can investigate and conduct searches and raids, and, and then they can also um, uh, also, I believe there's some forfeiture provisions as well. So the VCCA is going to have broad enforcement authority, just like the Virginia ABC authority. The next question might be more for you, Jeff. Uh, can you be a nonprofit in the cannabis industry? Uh, you know, that's uh, the, the, the term nonprofit is not a very specific legal term. If you're thinking about being a tax exempt uh, charity uh, under 501c3, no, that's not going to work. The IRS uh, requirements for what it takes to be a charity uh, are, are are stringent. So you're not going to be able to get tax exempt donations in a 501c3 operating one of these businesses. Um, you know, could you be some type of 501? C4, uh, a social welfare organization? Probably not. You know, the, the IRS tells what categories of uh, purpose are allowed under their tax exempt designations. And right now, marijuana sales or cultivation or is, is not one of those categories. Okay. The next question um, I think is also more for you, Jeff. Are there any special considerations that need to be made for exit opportunities for a Virginia cannabis business outside of those for a business of another type? Well, I think I think getting back to your uh, enforcement um, and the the complexity with the the federal laws, um, there might be in these these agreements with the exit strategy some type of indemnity. In other words, if I bail but uh, it looks like uh, the things that I did while I was here were actually a violation of federal law and the federal law enforcement comes in and there's a fine on the company. Will there be an indemnity for the person who left but was part of the problem that, that caused that fine? That's one of the things that I can see, uh, and, but that's that would be similar to any heavily regu regulated uh, industry that you would see. Okay. Um, the next question is also for you, Jeff. Uh, because marijuana remains unlawful on the federal level, is there any likelihood of IRS tax, tax liability arising in the immediate future? We all know that the fact that your revenue um, was illegal doesn't mean it's tax-free. In fact, that, that's how they got Al Capone, right? <laughs> um, right now, uh, the IRS I, – I, what I don't see is any special provisions at the IRS level regulating the various states who have already – uh, entered into the, the sale of marijuana. I think that the IRS is quite happy uh, putting, having businesses put income on their returns and paying taxes. Um, so right now, no, there's no specific enforcement by the IRS uh, against these. They're, they're, they love it, I think. It's just another source of revenue. Right. Um, next question is, uh, does any of the legislation leave open for cannabis tourism? Is there anything that addresses cannabis tourism in the legislation, Jonathan? So no, there is, you know, cannabis tourism, for anybody who's not familiar with that term, it's it's basically allowing people to consume marijuana while they're traveling to a particular destination, you know, come come to our uh, whatever uh, bed and breakfast, butt and breakfast, I've heard of one of them called. There's nothing in the provisions uh, that that allow specifically for that. But I did mention that provision before that could become effective if reenacted that uh, prohibits transportation into into the state. So it, no, it doesn't provide for that uh, specifically in the law. Okay, I think I know the answer to the next one and um, I think everyone can probably guess it, but I enjoy the question so I'm gonna read it out loud anyway. It looks like someone's thinking of ways to make money off a of grandma. Can a person give, rent, sell their right to grow? For example, an elderly person in a nursing home. How is household defined? 
Oh yeah. So household household def is defined as um, individuals related or not living in the same house or place of residence. Uh, um, so it, it, the person can't have grandma in the nursing home grow some plants for them. Yeah, and the, the other thing is, uh, and if it's talking about licenses itself, licenses are not transferable between between uh, businesses or individuals. I imagine the person was asking about the exception that allows you to grow a plant for personal use. Um, so the, the next question is, is there any indication of how attenuate the relationship to the business to the mayor of the business, the marijuana industry must be in order to be disqualified from SBA loans. Any recent examples from other states? Uh, we've been talking a lot about this um, internally, and the guidance from the SBA is very broad. They do give the example that if you're a plumber that comes in and fixes pipes for a marijuana business, then you are not considered an indirect marijuana or direct marijuana business, and you would still be eligible for SBA loans. But there isn't a lot of other real specific details or guidance. And you can imagine this being taken to the extreme. But one of the things the regulations talk about is whether it would be reasonable or, um, and Jonathan, jump in if you can remember the words better than I, but whether what you're selling is foreseeable as um, something that would be used by the marijuana industry and whether you're directly supplying to the marijuana industry. Yes, that's that's correct. Something that's reasonably determined to aid in the use, growth, enhancement, or other development of marijuana. That's right. Okay. The next question is: Does the labor portion of the bill have to be revoted in the next session? I don't believe so. I believe that's part that's in there. Do you know, Jonathan? Um, I think that's that's in there. I don't believe that has to be revoted. No. Next question is, in Virginia, what is the legal status of Delta 8? Does the new law address it? It does not. Delta 8 is, and now they're talking about Delta 10. No, it doesn't address the legality of Delta 8. And, and quite frankly, it's so new. A lot of, a lot of uh, states are grappling with that right now. Okay. We're at 102. Should we keep doing um, a few more questions? Or um, I don't want to impose too much on people's times. What do you think, Jeff and Jonathan? Uh, I'm, fine I'm available. Taking, yeah, All right. I'm we'll, we'll do more. a couple more. All right. So the next one is, do we have any details as to what defines a resident? Um, well, somebody who's been domiciled or resided as, for the purposes of applications, it is somebody who has been domiciled or resided in Virginia for the last 12 months. So a, a fixed, fixed uh, home or business, you know, it, fixed, it is likely they home. will use the, 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 the tax, the Virginia Department of Taxation uses concept of domicile um, because people like to say that they actually live in Florida uh, because they right. don't have a state income tax. So they're going to be looking at where are you registered to vote? Where are your cars registered? Do you have a lease? Do you have a mortgage? Where do your kids go to school? Does your spouse have a job? Where's that their job? You know, where's the W-2? They're going to look at all that. You can't just, you know, be in Moyoc or in, in, in Maryland and, and pretend that you're a Virginia resident just because you're close. Yeah, that's right. They'll reference back to, to that particular law, but resident is not specifically defined in this particular one. Uh, the next question is, um, does the law make any special regards for individuals that hold hemp processing license licenses that are applying for vertical integration? Yeah, so um, it allows uh, registered hemp processors to obtain licenses if they want to have a license in more than one of the categories discussed. Uh, they need to go through several requirements, including uh, paying a million dollars to the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority. Wow. Um, the next question is, will the Commonwealth set the sales price at, um, that, at which a licensee can sell cannabis, or will the licensee be able to set their own prices? Right now, though, that's up to the regulations of the VCCEA, which aren't written yet. Um, it does allow the VCCEA to set limits on the potency. Um, doesn't talk about the pricing uh, by the VCCA. Okay. Uh, the next question is, is there a cap on the number of social equity applications or can all the licenses go to SEAs? And I believe the answer is that there's no rule on um, that. Is that correct, Jonathan? 
Yeah, there is no cap. They just have to meet the qualifications uh, as far as social equity applicants. But they could conceivably give all the licenses to social equity applicants if they wanted to. They're supposed to pr have a preference for them between July 1st, 2023 and January 1st, 2024. Um, I, conceivably, they could, but um, it doesn't say that it, yes or no on that, just that they get a preference. And there's no limit to the number of applicants as long as they qualify. Has it been determined when the application process will begin? So as I said before, um, this has to be reenacted in 2022, but right now, the way the law is set up, the VCCA can start accepting applications for licenses beginning July 1st, 2023. They can start accepting them. There are a couple questions here about legally transferring plant stocks such as seeds, clones, and mothers. Is that legal now? Can you legally buy seeds online um, starting on July 1st? Um, the <laughs> that is still seeds and clones and mothers are still considered marijuana because it's any part of the plant. Uh, this law does not legalize that, nor nor does that nor is it legal under federal law. So that kind of raises an interesting question. The Virginia law allows people to have um, a small number of plants in their home for personal consumption. How do you get those plants? Yeah, so this is the chicken and the egg that if anybody watches the discussion in the General Assembly during the passage of this bill, that very question was raised uh, that the law is making it legal to possess and for home grow. But where are they going to get them? Um, that's not addressed in the law where they get them. Yeah, I don't think you'll be able to pick it up at McDonald's nursery. No. Uh, will medical laws stay under the Virginia Board of Pharmacy after July 1st, 2024, or is there a plan to transition it to the VCCA? So the law uh, conti it continues the regulations governing pharmaceutical processors uh, to continue through beginning on July 1st, 2021, until the Board of Directors of the VCCA promotes its regulations uh, that are um, supposed to be promulgated no later than July 1st, 2023. So it looks like it's it may trans it's going to transition over to the VCCA, but the VCCA, there's a provision in the law that says they should write their regulations to ensure that they are as close as possible to the existing regulations of the Board of Pharmacy. See, the next question is, um, how will they determine the location of retail outlets? And my understanding is that the VCCA is supposed to make them geographically um, dispersed, but I don't think there's anything more precise. Is there, Jonathan? There's not. They're supposed to evaluate on geographic dispersion for retail uh, establishments. Uh, and then they also have to look at census board uh, data with regard to locations of social equity applicants. But no, they're not. They haven't listed how they're going to do it, just that they have to review it. There's a question about um, how many vertically integrated licenses will be issued. Does the law say? It does not say. We don't know. The next question is whether or not someone who's middle class would be given a preference to be a licensee as a business owner, and that would not qualify you as a social equity license um, applicant. There are specific uh, factors that they look at, and we did have a slide on that, and being middle class would not be one of those factors. Um, next question, if I heard you correctly, I heard that there isn't a caregiver program currently or in the future. For example, set producers for set patients. Access is difficult currently for elderly and sick in the Southwest. Um, patients can, Southwest Virginia, patients cannot realistically travel to an on-site location to access their medicine seems logical to allow sister companies within the region to allow access to more patients, therefore allowing a more sustainable medical program. I mean, I think that's really kind of pointing out something that should be, um, you know, a change in the law, but we don't have that yet, do we? No, but again, the VCCA has broad regulatory authority. That is not specifically addressed in the law, but the, the VCCA has broad regulatory authority to implement the program. Whether they put it in regulation or not, we don't know yet. The next question is asking where the VCCA board information is located. Uh, right now, it's just in the legislation that passed. I don't think there's anything else, is there? No, it's just in the legislation that's passed. It's part of the, the VCCA is going to be to part of the uh, uh, State Department of Homeland Security. I checked their website uh, recently and nothing is up yet. 
ask a landlord what provisions or limitations are to be in place as to what real estate can and cannot be used for in this business, i.e. 25 yards from a school, et cetera. If you're talking about a licensee as a cultivator, I think that's what that means. I mean, home grow is home grow in, in your residence. But if you're talking about licensee as a cultivator, um, there are provisions. They're going to be more uh, definitive with when the VCCA writes its regulations. That's the problem. There's the, the, the broad authority of the VCCA to write regulations is that the legislature gave them a broad framework and said, OK, you write these regulations to say where these things can be and where they can't be. Um, so we have to wait and see what the restrictions are in more detail from the regulations. Uh, the next question um, is for you, Jeff. It's about taxes. As you know, you can't deduct business expenses if your um, revenue is from illegal goods such as marijuana. So marijuana growers can't take business deductions like other businesses. They can only deduct the cost of goods sold. So the question is, the, since the cost of goods sold is the only thing that can be deducted from income to tax from taxable income for cannabis business, how aggressive can you be in calculating inventory and cost of goods sold? That's a great question, and it goes right back to that tension between the states opening up and the federal law lagging behind. Um, I think that uh, the the by the time 2024 comes around, the there will be likely legislation that is going to tell us one way or another how it's going to work. Um, but right now, um, there's just no guidance on it. There's there's no federal guidance in the IRS regulations or in the Internal Revenue Code um, about what happens when the states start making this legal and there's you know national consensus that's going to happen. We're just in a gray area and we're just going to have to wait and to see some of the federal legislation that we've been talking about because once that happens, if that does open it up, then the IRS is going to follow suit. Again, they're going to they're going to want to encourage any business that's going to be bringing in revenue and paying taxes but right now i you know we just don't have any that the law is what the law is on the books and so those those prohibitions against um deducting uh illegal activities are still there the next question is about whether when the vcca is formed this upcoming july whether they will publish fees and guidelines for the applicants um in more detail and that certainly is our hope uh do you have anything further on that jonathan uh, yes, I'm sure that they will. They'll, they'll put it out there, the application process. Um, let's see, a few questions about downloading the presentation. You will receive an email from us that will thank you for attending, and that will have a link where you can download the presentation. You'll get that um, probably later today. Next question, cuttings of cannabis plants don't have THC levels until flowering. Is there a gray area to supply potential home growers with plant cuttings? Uh, th that again is, is not specifically addressed uh, in the law. Um, so I don't really have any comment on that right now yeah. unless the law is modified. Yeah, it's it's frustrating. There are there are a lot of great questions here that we just don't have answers for yet because there's a lot of um, areas where the legislature needs to provide some more information. Um, next question: As an IT consultant, what concerns concerns should I have in providing IT products and services to cannabis businesses? That gets to that SBA guidance we talked about earlier, um, and whether or not you would be considered an indirect marijuana business. I I think that an IT um, service would probably be more like the plumber situation where just the fact that one of your customers is a marijuana business wouldn't disqualify you from SBA loans. But um, Jonathan and Jeff, what do you two think? I think that's right. Based on the guidance from SBA, um, there are some examples with, with uh, delivering IT services, but um, just read those, read those FAQs on the SBA website and the guidance very carefully. Yeah, I think as, as close as you can stay to the plumber, the, the yeah. safer it's going to be. And a question about who gets to make the appointments to the VCCA. Is it the um, secretary of the Commonwealth or the governor who makes appointments to the VCCA? Do we know uh, yet? It's yeah, it's listed. I, I think there's multiple 
multiple appointments by multiple um, authorities. I, I can't the, tell you exactly. Does the law say um, how many members will be on the VCCA? Uh, well, the, uh, the board itself, um, uh, um, there's an advisory council that assists the board with a total of, I think, 21 members. Um, and the board itself, I cannot remember exactly how many members are on the board. It's obviously a limited number, but I can't tell you off the top of my head the number. Sure. It's listed in the law. Uh, the next question is whether the four plant count applies to all stages of cultivation or is it just four mature plants and then maybe you could have some additional plants that weren't mature yet. I think it's just um, four total, isn't it? Yeah, it's four plants. If I don't have space to grow my four plants, can I rent the space? Um, the I law think that's where we cross the line. I think yeah. that's where we cross the line. You know, that's you're no longer a plumber. Uh, now, now you're starting to be more actively involved in the business. I think that, I would think, I think so that, too. Uh, some, uh, someone who's leasing space for the purpose of cultivation is is likely uh, going to cross that line. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that would be allowed. Um, this looks like the last question. Uh, steady genetics testing below three percent at time of transport are hemp to me. Hemp, by definition, marijuana is a made-up word. Um, Okay, I don't think that's really a question to someone making a comment. So that's it for questions. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we do appreciate it. And I particularly enjoy that we got so many questions. Um, as I said, you will be receiving a thank you email and that will have a link to a copy of the presentation, including a recording. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank bye. you, everybody. All right, bye.